Welcome everybody to the third chapter in which we talk all about the art of swindling. Now, importantly, we will not be talking about how to flag people or how to catch people on their pre-moves. We will be talking actually about the position and about how to swindle somebody on the board. We will be talking about the clock as a method, as an auxiliary method to swindling. But above all, we will be talking about how to acquire that trickiness, that inherent resilience that will make you a beast at bullet and blitz. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the art of being tricky. Now, a lot of people, you know, sort of compliment me on this with kind of an edge after I'm, you know, I land in a completely lost position and then I managed to trick someone. Well, how did you do that? I seem to have plenty of time and I was completely winning. And one of the most important things that you have to do is that when you land in a position where you are objectively lost, from a psychological standpoint, you cannot lose hope and you always have to look at chances against your opponent's king, even in end games, even in positions with very limited material where it seems like all hope is lost. My experience has convinced me that there's almost always some way to create chances. And to show that, um, I want to show the end of a game that I played. Um, here I have the black pieces against Armenian Grandmaster Tigran Petrosian, uh, not the world champion, but a uh, a young GM from Armenia, and I have the black pieces here. And it's immediately clear that in this position, white is just completely winning. First of all, he's up a pawn. Second of all, my pawn structure is absolutely, completely, totally ruined. His pieces are beautifully harmonized. It seems that there's no counterplay. My pieces are incredibly passive. And so you know, having 30 seconds, 30 plus seconds, it seems like the game is basically over. But before resigning, I asked myself one very important question that you have to ask yourself. Even in end games, even in positions with very limited material, my experience convinces me that there's almost always some sort of trick to be found against your opponent's king. And once I started paying attention to his king, the roots of a very tricky tactical idea began to materialize in my mind. And I started with the move king g8, a very important move, obviously defending against rook h7 check, followed by rook takes rook, and then there's really going to be no chances, and he's going to pick up a second pawn on a7. Tigran, seeing no danger, correctly so, responded with bishop takes f6, picking up a second pawn. Now it seems like the game is definitely over, and here I made the move a4. Now this seems to be a, an example of, you know, classic Naroditsky tilts. Uh, making a couple of, of random moves before resigning. And this is what you want your opponent to think. Your opponent, especially in an end game, is going to be not necessarily looking for danger against his own king because attacks are rare in the end game, and that's what you have to capitalize on. So I play a4, Tigran quickly plays rook h8, check king f7. It looks like he can pick up uh, the rook with either piece, but of course picking it up with the rook allows me to take the bishop, so he decided to take it with the bishop. And lo and behold, I struck with a check on b3, and it turns out that it is not only check, but on the next move, it is checkmate after either king c1 or king b1, rook d1. And in this position, Tigran, maybe after banging his table, uh, resigned the game. And of course, one may say I got very lucky, and I did, but isn't this series called How to Get Lucky in Chess? You got to manufacture your own luck. And in order to do that, the cornerstone of any lucky player is one who looks for tactical tricks against his opponent's king in every position, even in endgames. In this next example, we will be looking at ways to use the fact that your opponent is low on time in order to climb out of seemingly completely lost positions. And in order to, to demonstrate that, I'd like to show um, a bullet game that I recently played against none other than Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura, uh, who is hopefully familiar to you as one of the, if not the strongest bullet and blitz player, not only of our time, but in the history of chess. And in this particular game, I had the white pieces, and it's quite clear um, that I am the one holding all of the cards. As Walter White would say, I'm the one who knocks, and I knocked on the door of his king with a move knight d5 check in this position, which uh, seems to be, and in fact is, the winning combination. He's forced to take my knight. I give him another check on e1, distracting the bishop from g6, and now, bump rook f7 check winning his queen, and I expected Hikaru to resign in this position. I'm up a queen, and it seems I have a mating attack. But what Hikaru decided to do is a technique that you should be very well aware of. When you are completely lost, 
and your opponent is up material, what you want your opponent to do is go on a king chase. Because when your opponent is low on time, his mind is going to be looking for ways to finish you off, to deliver checkmate. And one of the hardest things in chess is actually to finish off a king hunt. The king is an incredibly tricky piece in an open board. And Hikaru, instead of resigning or going king g8, which would make his king a sitting duck, ventures forth with king g6. I have about 15 seconds at this point. I give him another check and I take on e4, opening up the f5 square. Hikaru fearlessly takes back and goes further to h4. And all of a sudden, I play the move king g2, covering up the g3 square. I think the game is over, but I also have about four to five seconds at this point. And Hikaru makes this, the brilliant bullet move h5. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. My palms are sweating. I have six seconds left. I'm thinking about how to access that darn king of his. And I can't seem to find a way because if my queen gets to g3, he runs back to, to g5. Now, it turns out that mate is yielded with the somewhat counterintuitive move g takes h5, which just to my eye looks a little bit hard to see. But after that, there's queen g4 mate. But I played the alternative g5, intending queen f4 checkmate only to meet with the brilliant rook a f8 and it turns out that the king is now out of the cage queen e5 threatening queen g3 mate rook f3 x clam and i have to settle for winning a rook i have about two seconds at this point and hikaru effortlessly flagged me from this position so the moral of the story is that when you are completely lost in down material but your opponent is a little bit low on time one thing you want to tempt him into doing is to look directly for checkmate because in doing so he will be burning a lot of clock and if he doesn't find the checkmate he's going to end up getting flagged and he's going to end up demoralized for the long match that is to come so remember that make your opponent checkmate you don't just fold over and die in the next example uh, i'd like to talk about using tactics to your advantage in trying to swindle your opponent and what you see in front of you is a game uh, that I also played in the uh, Pro Chess League, which is uh, composed of rapid games, 15 plus 2. But by this point in the game, um, in which I was facing Cuban-American Grandmaster Fidel Corrales, I had the black pieces here. We were looking at it from Fidel's point of view. We were both down to a couple of seconds on our clock. And take a moment to adjust uh, to this position. Now... Black is up a pawn, and he's also currently up a rook. The pawn doesn't matter at all, because clearly there's stuff going on with both of these kings. White can recapture the rook in one of two ways. He can recapture with the queen. But Fidel correctly decided that here's the thing. In this endgame, objectively speaking, uh, it's not that white is completely lost here. White can still defend. But end games like this, where really the king is out of any danger, and we talked about this Earlier, sometimes you can create chances against the king even in an end game, but not here. Black's going to have a very, very easy time uh, setting up threats against white's king using this far advanced passer. So it's very important when you're trying to swindle your opponent, when you're in a very precarious situation, to make highly practical decisions. You won't be able to calculate everything, but you have to have the tactics on your side. That's the catchphrase that I'd like you guys to remember. What Fidel decided to do was make the fearless move rook takes f6 which looks like it loses to a couple of responses. But having five seconds, I suddenly realize, first of all, if I give him a check on h1, his king starts running. Remember, guys, make your opponent checkmate you. In a time scramble, it's very hard to complete a king hunt, and it turns out that the king actually objectively escapes to e3 and f4 and g5. And having seen that, I decided to give a check on e1, which, as it turns out, is a massive blunder. To rook f1, not only does that win the queen, but that is also checkmate. But the kicker is Fidel missed that, and he played the move king h2. And I actually was winning here with a brilliant move g3 check, breaking uh, the possibility of a discovery. If queen takes pawn, then queen h1 is going to be checkmate, whereas if king h3, then bishop g2 is going to win the queen. But have the tactics on your side. He has the possibility of discovery, and I have to find this obscure hard combination with two seconds on my clock. No surprise then that I gave a very natural check on h1 and another natural check on d3 only to meet with rook f3. And not only did I jump out of my chair, but I was tempted to, to break a lot of objects in the room that I was playing. In. Now, again, you might say, you know what, that's pure luck. I don't miss maiden one every day. 
But to that, I respond, if you set up the tactics in the time scramble, if you have ideas like a discover check or the possibility of a fork, that's going to make your opponent blunder because your opponent is not going to be able to calculate the details of a particular line with two or three seconds left, or even sometimes with 30 seconds left. So remember, when you're in a very precarious situation, set up tactics and always have the tactics on your side. In this next example, I'd like to talk about one very specific technique uh, that you should be aware of when your back is to the wall. And what I'm referring to more specifically is the importance of having knights. Now, you might be rolling your eyes a little bit, but allow me to explain. And to do so, I'd like to show you a segment of a game that I recently played. It's a bullet game against uh, Grandmaster Andrew Tang, the notorious and the one and only Penguin GM1. Uh, I have the black pieces here, and we join the battle in what seems to be a complicated position, but one in which I'm getting absolutely steamrolls. Despite the fact that Andrew is down in exchange, he's attacking my queen, and uh, it just looks like another game where he's going to blow me off the board. And in this position, rather than moving my queen, say, to c7 and a6 and trying to cling to the extra exchange, I decided to to make a very strategic move, I sacrificed the exchange for the bishop. And what this gave me is the situation in which I had two knights against two bishops. And what I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is that in a blitz game, in a bullet game, in any game where your opponent has anything, let's say, under three minutes, having a knight, or especially having two knights, and your opponent not having any knights, gives you a tremendous tactical advantage because knights are very difficult pieces to monitor in a serious time scramble because knights can do forks, they can attack pieces. It's hard to see sometimes when a knight attacks a piece or threatens a fork. And this is no juvenile tactic. This is a high level game, which I was really trying to win. And even the strongest grandmasters, even Hikaru and Magnus struggle with containing knights. Watch how this game unfolds. Now, from an objective standpoint, I am completely lost here, but because I have my two knights, what I'm doing is continually attacking Andrew's queen. I'm making him stand on guard. Now I'm activating the rook. Note those knights are pretty, pretty imposing. I can even trade rooks here. Now I'm biding my time, starting to push my pawn. He's getting intimidated. Andrew at this point is about, you know, maybe three or four seconds, and he plays a brilliant just kidding. It's not a brilliant move, but he plays the move queen d4. Now, before you roll your eyes and say, well, I seem to be getting lucky yet again. Now, remember the title of this series. Why did I get lucky? Because I was consistently using my knights to attack Andrew's queen. And when he got really low on time, he made a natural move trying to centralize his queen. Of course, blundering it to the knight. Now, it turns out the game is not over yet because I can't move my own knight because his bishops have something to say and they would pin my queen. However, the rest is basically uh, an easy flagging job. Now, if you want to refresh a course on flagging, you know where to turn to. Chapter 1, uh, some parts of Chapter 2. Uh, I have the queen. I have the possibility of giving all the checks. So as soon as I escaped the checks with my own king, I was able to give checks to Andrew's king. And there's simply no way that he's able to pre-move. I'm using here the technique of trying to cut him off against his pre-moves. Queen e6 in case he had pre-moved king c4, remember that. And we made a lot of moves because Andrew is one of the fastest guys on the planet. I'm going to basically fast forward through this. But with my kind of savvy queen moves, my anti-pre-move moves, even though I gave up my queen, I had one pawn remaining. And at this point, he had 0.01 seconds and he lost on time before he could capture my pawn. Now, if you were truly skilled at flagging, you would not play the move queen d5 check. But at this point, it was a mad time scramble. And so remember... Knights are incredible trump cards in blitz and bullet games. So if you can have a position where you have two knights against two bishops or a knight against a bishop, you can eliminate your opponent's knight. Even though you might be completely lost, the tactical potential of knights very often compensates for uh, objective deficiencies in a position. So remember, use your knights, use them well, activate them, attack your opponent's pieces with them, threaten forks. Knights are incredible tacticians. I hope you enjoyed uh, this chapter of uh, how to get lucky in chess, in which we talked about various techniques to swindle your opponent from anything from a dubious position uh, to a completely lost and seemingly hopeless position. Now, we covered a lot of devious, and I would even say devilish, maybe even demonic uh, techniques for swindling 
uh, your opponent. We talked about the art of being tricky and resilient. Um, we saw my game against Petrosian. We talked about a very important technique where you might be down a lot of material, you might be completely lost, but if you force your opponent to try to checkmate you and go on a king hunt, you might deplete his time resources, and then with a couple of seconds, he might not find the only mating sequence. And of course, here we talked about uh, using your knights incredibly well and using them actively. And we saw in my game against Fidel Corrales that if you use your use your tactical opportunities and have the tactics work in your favor, uh, very often you can go through some incredibly dubious positions and you can get out of them precisely because the ball is in your opponent's court. So remember, when you get a lost position in a blitz and bullet game, the game is by no means over. Remember these games, apply these techniques, and good luck swindling some lost positions. And remember, hope you enjoy this chapter. You can always comment below, participate with comments and questions. See you in the next chapter.